Is the Middle East heading to a regional war? It's a question that's been asked repeatedly since the start of Israel's war on Gaza. It's a question that we've asked on this podcast. The general assumption is that any regional conflict would start with the opening of a new military front in northern Israel to confront Hezbollah in Lebanon. That front has now opened. Israeli airstrikes have increased sharply since September. And at the start of October, Israeli troops crossed the border into southern Lebanon. Is the Middle East heading to a regional war? Sort of, but not quite. It's certainly spread beyond Israel and Palestine. Things are bad and getting worse. But it's also difficult to frame it in terms of a regional conflict particularly as Iran continues to hold back on any major escalation beyond retaliatory strikes. But that does not make current events any less serious. In Lebanon, Israel is going after Hezbollah. The Iran-backed group is being hit from the sky by warplanes and on the ground is fighting Israeli soldiers. This week, how is Lebanon coping with the rising violence and the ever-growing risks? Is this the end of Hezbollah? And can a deal be done so that Lebanon avoids the same fate that Israel has imposed on Gaza? My name is Hugo Goodridge, and you're listening to The New Arab Voice. Israel has been targeting Lebanon and Hezbollah targets in Lebanon since the start of the war against Gaza. But in September, these efforts escalated rapidly. On September 17th, Thousands of pages used by Hezbollah members detonated simultaneously across Lebanon. At least 12 people were killed and thousands more were injured, and hospitals quickly became overwhelmed. The next day, more attacks, this time exploding walkie-talkies. Another 20 people were killed and hundreds more wounded. It was a highly audacious and coordinated attack. It struck hard at Hezbollah, the communications network, and the country as a whole. It was also described as terrorism. Over the next nine days, Israeli airstrikes began pounding Lebanon. Southern Lebanon took the worst of the attacks, but also the south of Beirut, a densely populated part of the Lebanese capital. All these attacks built up to an airstrike on September 27th that killed Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah. Since then, and to this date, the attacks have continued, spreading further across the country and killing more people. Additionally, on October 1st, the Israeli military announced that their troops had crossed the border into Lebanon. A further escalation and a worrying development. So let's start with the capital. It's very mixed. There are certain areas in Beirut that is operating as if they are on another planet while there's other parts of Beirut that have been directly impacted by Israel's war on the country. So you've got those two poles. This is Yazan al-Sadi, the New Arab's international editor who lives in Beirut. Overall, though, it's a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of fear of the future. It's a lot of concerns, a lot of anger towards uh, the injustice that is happening. And there is blame on multiple parties for what is going on. So it's a very precarious moment for the city, the country, the society. And the impact on people is still, uh, we're all trying to comprehend it. You know, the impact in terms of the healthcare system, the economic system, just normal life. It's still, we're all seeing what is happening because... It's a huge, huge earthquake for for everyone here. To date, Israeli airstrikes have mainly targeted the south of the country and the southern part of the capital. But not exclusively, they've also hit the north and east and west of the country and the centre of Beirut. There is a sense of surprise in terms of how far Israel is going to a lot of people. There were, you know, assumptions that, oh, this isn't going to be... This isn't going to break out into a war or it's going to be around, you know, 2006 level, which had, you know, 
limitations compared to something like 1982. But what we're seeing now is something that is worse than 2006, probably will reach the level of the violence of 1982 or more, because again, we're talking about an Israel that has crossed the Rubicon in a lot of ways in terms of its psychology and mentality. The death toll in the past two weeks has surpassed what happened in 2006, which was over 33, 34 days. Yeah, it's it's quite shocking. And I think a lot of people are slowly grasping the scope of this. A quick bit of Hezbollah revision. Hezbollah was founded in 1982 during the height of the Lebanese Civil War. Hezbollah is a Shia Islamist group with both a political wing and a paramilitary wing. Since their inception, they have been supported by Iran with both arms and money. Also in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, looking to attack Palestinian Liberation Organization targets. Israel would eventually withdraw from Lebanon in 2000. The 1982 war was the first major confrontation between Israel and Hezbollah. 2006 saw the second major confrontation when, again, Israel invaded Lebanon. Israel withdrew 34 days later. With the outbreak of the Syrian civil war, thousands of fighters from Hezbollah travelled to Syria to support the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. As well as being a paramilitary organisation, they also have a political branch. At the last parliamentary election in Lebanon, Hezbollah secured just shy of 20% of the vote. For a multi-party state, this represents a large share of the vote. Today, much of the focus is on their military forces, and if they have the strength to repeat the defences of 1982 and 2006. I would say that Hezbollah was perhaps the most powerful non-state actor on earth. This is David Daoud. David is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies with a focus on Hezbollah, Lebanon and Israel. Uh, we're talking about an organization that is reported to have amassed an array of weapons that uh, you know, included something up to 200,000 projectiles or the estimates. You know, And this is a mixture of anti-tank guided missiles, short range rockets. And when we talk about short range talking about 40 kilometers, give and take, uh, uh, drones of various sorts, loitering munitions, more lo- you know, longer range uh, projectiles, you know, precision guided missiles, and a fighting force that you know, there have been estimates somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 fighters. Now, not all of these are... Hamas and Hezbollah are similar in many ways. Both Islamist organizations, both vehemently opposed to Israel's occupation, but Hezbollah far outweighs Hamas's military capabilities. Specific numbers are difficult to come by, but we do have a good approximation of their fighting forces and capabilities. Although it's worth mentioning that not all of their tens of thousands of fighters are what you would describe as career soldiers. Many are enthusiastic amateurs. There is another difference between Hamas and Hezbollah worth mentioning. Hezbollah has had offensive experience whereas Hamas has not had that offensive experience in the past. Uh, you know, in Syria, particularly, Hezbollah acted, I don't want to say as a standing army, but uh, as close enough to one as possible. So they have offensive experience. This is a tried and tested organization. But all this was before Israeli attacks on Hezbollah really started to ramp up. And we've seen you know, Israel's attacks uh, since September 17th have been meant to throw Hezbollah off kilter, you know, complicate, if not sever, their ability to communicate between different cells, uh, wiping out senior military and political leadership. Yes, there's been targeting of the arsenal. We've we've seen the IDF put out num- estimates that 30% of Hezbollah's arsenal remains. What part of that arsenal that is, right, is 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 an open question. Is it the precision guided missiles? Is it you know the the short range katushas? But Hezbollah's ability to deploy all of that strength was, uh, I don't want to say decimated, but severely set back in the 10 days or so between September 17th, uh, and I would say especially up to the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah. Hezbollah has never really been hit harder by Israel. On September 23rd, 1,600 Hezbollah targets were hit by Israel, killing at least 492, including 30 children and 58 women. 
That was just a single day. It would be very hard to deny that this isn't having an impact on the group. How much of an impact, particularly when it comes to the number of casualties, that's a bit more difficult to gauge. They're not revealing, you know, who's dying where uh, or at all. So we don't know how, much, how, many Hez- how many fighters Hezbollah is losing. If, you know, if the Israelis are losing five and Hezbollah is losing, say, 50 for each of those five, that's yeah, it's clearly not, you know, satiric victory if it's a victory at all for Hezbollah. How long they'll be able to sustain this is a question. And again, how long they'll be able to sustain this if the Israelis decide they need to go further, they, they need to ratchet up to the next level of pressure. That'll be seen when that happens. While we don't know the exact numbers, there are some that we can categorically say have been killed, given their leadership profiles. Israel has been relentlessly targeting Hezbollah's leadership, with Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah being their most notable accomplishment. There is an obvious significance to these killings. But are they making an impact? Or are these eventualities that the group both expected and planned for? On the one hand, you know, I think where the Israeli strategy has failed, right? There's this, this conversation in the counterterrorism field, there's decapitation, right? Does removing a leader or leadership cadre uh, lead to the dissolution or degradation of, of, a, of a terrorist organization? And, you know, there's opinions back and forth. And I think where the Israelis have almost gamed the system on this is they've gone wide in rapid succession and they've gone deep. Right. In the sense that they're not just killing the immediate leader or his successor, they're killing the successor's successor and sometimes three or four levels down. So, you know, if the next person in line is already kind of four rungs down on the ladder, does this person even have the capability, the knowledge, the veterancy, uh, the experience to run either Hezbollah writ large or the components of Hezbollah that they may have to assume control over when this is a very sophisticated organization? So I think there, there has been a, definitely a degradation of Hezbollah's experience and expertise that has happened. Hezbollah has certainly been degraded, both through attacks on its leadership and attacks on its military stores and supplies. As within Gaza, Israel does not appear overly concerned about how much collateral damage and how many casualties they cause. And with the number of Lebanese dead rising every day, a debate has erupted in Lebanon. Yazan al Sadi again. Obviously, there is the immediate blame on Israel, the aggressor here that is committing uh, massacres and flattening residential buildings. There is also blame on Hezbollah for, quote-unquote, dragging the country into a fight. There is blame on the government because regardless of a lot of statements prior to Israel's invasion of the country on September 30th, around September 30th, October 1st. Prior to that, a lot of ministers were saying that the country is prepared to handle the impact, which turned out not to be true. A lot of people are displaced, more than a million people, and there's not enough shelters for multiple reasons. So there's blame to the government and the politicians, and there's blame on the international community for basically allowing this to happen. So a lot of blame is going around. At this point, it's probably worth asking, what does Israel want? In Gaza, Israel has spoken about the total destruction of Hamas. Does it want the same for Hezbollah? Also acknowledges that this is a war of who's going to scream out in pain first, right? It's it's the Israelis ratcheting up the pressure on Hezbollah to get them to back down off of this goal of continuing to attack northern Israel in support of Gaza and to back off the border. Since the start of the war in Gaza, Hezbollah has launched frequent barrages of rockets across the border and into northern Israel. This has forced around 60,000 Israelis to flee their homes. On September 16th, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu added the return of the northern Israelis to their homes as an objective of the war. In with the shadow of October October 7th in their minds, seeing Hezbollah operatives along the border, they won't return home, right? This will lead to a de facto depopulation of the north. And so I think the Israelis are saying, okay, we're going to keep ratcheting up pressure until Hezbollah screams out in pain first. And Hezbollah is saying, well, we're going to make you scream out in pain first. So let's see, let's see who wins this contest of wills. Unlike in Gaza, for the time being, Israel appears to be content with the idea 
of simply deterring and preventing further attacks, as opposed to complete destruction. So I think the Israelis are settling for at least pushing the Hezbollah beyond the Litani, degrading their capabilities south of the Litani. The Litani River is in Lebanon and cuts across the country, around 30 to 40 kilometers north of the border with Israel. To where Hezbollah, is, neither its rockets uh, nor its fighters can pose a threat to northern Israel. And then let the Lebanese deal with the rest of it if they're so inclined. But my sense, and again, this isn't based on anything I've seen the Israelis necessarily say, just kind of following all the threads together, my sense is if the Israelis push to this point, any Hezbollah movement south of the Litani River is going to be met with Israeli force. Right? It's kind of going to be similar to bringing the war between the wars in Syria into Lebanon uh, moving forward, and then let the Lebanese figure out what they do to, with Hezbollah and what is Hezbollah's ultimate fate, so long as it no longer is capable of threatening uh, northern Israel. Amid the growing levels of violence in Lebanon, international parties have tried to secure a ceasefire deal. The United States in September had been working with France and other allies to effect a 21-day ceasefire to allow time for diplomacy to work and avert a broader Israeli action. This is Charles Dunn, adjunct professor at the Elliott School of International Relations, George Washington University, and senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C. The major change in the U.S. position has been the administration has decided to go along with and support Israel's efforts to degrade, if not eliminate, Hezbollah on the ground in hopes that it can lead to some kind of a diplomatic solution in the future. Initial efforts for a ceasefire failed pretty miserably, but just in the past couple of days, efforts have ramped up significantly. By the time you hear this, a ceasefire deal could be in place or could be coming in the next couple of days. Hezbollah's interim chief, Naim Qasim, has reportedly said that the group would agree to a ceasefire, but also said that a viable deal has yet to be presented. The most significant shift has been Hezbollah reportedly saying that they would no longer be linking a ceasefire agreement with Israel to the end of hostilities in Gaza. Israel, for their part, as mentioned earlier, would want to see Hezbollah move away from the border, but on the condition that they continue to have the freedom to target Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. A ceasefire deal would certainly be good for the people of Lebanon, but as with any ceasefire deal, it's only as good as the people who sign it. And we currently don't know how serious either side are about keeping to any terms of the deal. There's also been a slight shift in US thinking when it comes to Israel's regional military activities. Yeah, I think uh, the United States has recognized that Israel has the right to defend itself from Hezbollah attacks, mainly uh, uh, ballistic missile and drone attacks, which have taken place in many parts of the country. And the United States certainly recognizes that Israel has a right to create conditions in which the 60 southern people who have had to flee northern Israel because of the conflict should return. At the same time, in U.S. policy rhetoric right now, you don't hear that same mantra about Israel defending itself repeated as much as you did in the early days of the Gaza conflict. What you hear much more of is a focus on how this Israeli offensive can degrade Hezbollah and create an opening to restructure Lebanese politics in general. It's only a slight shift, but important nonetheless. There are a couple of likely reasons for this. The first is domestic in nature. I think there is a subtle realization by a lot of U.S. policymakers that Israel has a right to defend itself as a public talking point has lost a great deal of force, particularly among U.S. voters who have followed the news closely over the last year and are extremely upset about what has taken place in Gaza. There is a political consideration, I think, uh, involved in sort of the de-emphasis of that rhetorical aspect uh, in terms of United States policy. Interestingly, Lebanon's caretaker prime minister, Najib Makati, spoke of a possible deal before November 5th when U.S. citizens will go to the polls. The second likely reason is that the U.S. is not approaching Israel's war in Lebanon with the same attitude it approached Israel's war in Gaza. It's a more realistic and pragmatic approach. The United States would like to see Hezbollah as a non-factor in Lebanese politics, but uh, on the level of experts, 
they realize that that is really not going to be a realistic possibility. They are a very important political party. Even after this conflict, they will have significant military and organizational capabilities. They are seen by many Lebanese Shia as speaking for the Lebanese Shia community, and they run an extensive network of uh, social services, largely with the help of Iran, that has been a lifeline for many Lebanese as the, py- uh, as the poverty rate has skyrocketed, uh, the banking system has collapsed, and so on. So, you know, I think there is a realization among you know, the more realistic members of the U.S. policymaking community that not only is it not possible to make Hezbollah non-factor in Lebanon, it's probably not even desirable in some important ways. Untangling Hezbollah from Lebanon would be an almost impossible task. Hezbollah is more than a military group. They are also a political party and a popular political party. David Dawood again. They're the largest group in parliament by popular support, right? This is something that we, we, we tend to either ignore or it tends to be downplayed by you know, Lebanese activists in the United States. They won 356,000 votes uh, in the last parliamentary elections. That was the largest by any, any party, right? Uh, Lebanese Shiites, according to a recent poll, 89% had a very favorable opinion of Hezbollah. Uh, this is Washington Institute poll from January. Um, and 93% had a favorable opinion of Hezbollah. So this isn't a marginal actor. As well as being a highly popular political party, they are also part of a political system that has been fraught with divisions, intense disagreements, and ultimate stagnation. And this political stagnation is of particular interest to the U.S. And of course, the United States has also started emphasizing the importance of electing a new Lebanese president, which would be powered certainly to negotiate some kind of deal, if, even if indirectly, with Israel and help impose some kind of order and stability in the country. And this is one of the focuses of U.S. policy right now, is, is to try to somehow engineer a new presidential election, which would require the Speaker of the Parliament, and I'll be very, to call a special session to do this. But uh, the, the ducks are not aligned at the moment uh, to do that. But that's going to continue to be a focus of U.S. policy. Lebanon has been without a president since October 2022, despite multiple parliamentary sessions that have tried to break the deadlock. If one could be elected, that would be a big step in the right direction. But given the state of Lebanese politics, this would require a Herculean effort and with no guarantees of success. Let's say that by some political miracle, all the parties can agree on a new president tomorrow. It would be a good start. But it's just the first step. What follows would be intense negotiations between Hezbollah and the other parties. What we've heard from everyone across the political spectrum is even where we see a desire for Hezbollah uh, to either disarm or at least move north of the Litani, that will happen, as they've been saying, right, be it Wali Jumblat or, or you know, even, even Samir Jaja. Right on MTV, I think he said this about a week and a half ago. This will be done through dialogue and consensus. Wale Jumblat and Samir Jaja are both Lebanese political leaders for the Druze Progressive Socialist Party and the Christian Lebanese Forces Party, respectively. Hezbollah has a sizable block of public support. This gives them a legitimate uh, seat at the table in the Lebanese context, of course. And since Lebanon's decision making is all made by consensus, right, this dialogue and consensus that either Walid Jumblat or Mark Dahl or anyone else are talking about, they'd have to turn to Hezbollah and say, so guys, we all agree that you should disarm or at least move to the north of the Litani. Do you agree? And Hezbollah has the right at that point to say no. And then what are the re- what's the rest of the constellation of forces going to do? What we're seeing in Lebanon today is the sharp end of a debate that has raged in Lebanon for decades now. Should Hezbollah disarm? Lebanon's Christian, Druze and Sunni political parties believe that they should. They are politically and ideologically opposed to Hezbollah on many issues to varying degrees. They are also uncomfortable with one group having such a large, powerful military wing. Additionally, they would point to current events and say, look at what's happening. The military threat of Hezbollah is why Lebanon is being attacked. On the other side, Hezbollah and its supporters would also look at the current events and say, look at what's happening. This is exactly why we need a military force. 
to resist Israeli aggression. Additionally, they do not want to give up the strength that they have built up over so many years. So the, there, I don't think there's anything that could induce any force or constellation of forces in Lebanon, even assuming they had the capabilities, which they don't, to then have the will to drag the country into a civil war that is very likely unwinnable. I don't see anything besides you know, Lebanon, if they're able to kind of get a consensus outside of Hezbollah and then moving north of Litani, even if they're able to get that, to do anything but to ask Hezbollah nicely, so to speak, to move its forces north of Litani. And I don't see Hezbollah complying because they're not in the business of self-destruction and accepting those terms would be by default accepting Israel's terms. If there is a deal for Hezbollah to disarm and withdraw, and if Hezbollah agrees to the terms of the deal, then it calls into question the purpose of the group. They style themselves as a resistance. But if they're no longer resisting, who are they? So what's the point of us going through all of this of supporting you? We might as well go elsewhere. And I think Hezbollah realizes that. That's why they're they're stuck really between the commitment to Gaza and continuing to attack Israel and this war that they've now brought upon Lebanon. Currently, we don't know if a ceasefire deal can or will be struck, how long the ceasefire would last, or if the parties would agree to the terms of the deal. One thing to keep in mind is that we do already have a deal. It's called Resolution 1701. It's a UN Security Council resolution that was passed in 2006 and effectively ended the conflict between the two sides. It calls for a full secession of hostilities between the two sides, the withdrawal of Hezbollah and other forces from Lebanon south of the Litani River, the disarmament of Hezbollah and other groups, and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Lebanon. The only armed forces supposed to be in the area are the Lebanese Armed Forces and UNIFIL, or the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon. It would be them, and only them, who would keep the peace. The terms of the deal have never been adhered to, by either side, which isn't ideal, but better than war. First of all, the UNIFIL mission is pretty narrow, and it's been hobbled from the very beginning by repeated violations of its terms by both Israel and Hezbollah. So mostly what UNIFIL can do right now is report violations, but it's in absolutely no position uh, to confront either Israel or Hezbollah, uh, despite the fact that they have basically 10,000 troops on the, on the ground there. So it's been, it's been fairly ineffective. Plenty of the talk today surrounding a ceasefire deal is along the lines of returning to 1701 or maybe strengthening it somehow. I think 1701 is theoretically viable, but we can't expect it to become an effective enforcement mechanism, nor can we expect UNIFIL to become an effective enforcement mechanism without some major changes in the political attitudes of the parties, uh, including both Israel and Hezbollah, which would have to agree to withdraw its remaining fighters from the area. And I simply don't see that happening under the under the current circumstances. So you know, like a two-state solution in Palestine. The U.S. talks about this all the time, but practically speaking, it seems very, very far off in the distance, if it can be attained at all. In most countries, the defense of a nation would not be left to the armed wing of a political party. It would be the nation's military, which begs the question, where are the Lebanese armed forces? Lebanon has been invaded. Foreign planes are attacking civilians. Foreign soldiers are fighting on Lebanese territory. Right. Lebanon has, like all states, has an obligation under international law to prevent non-state actors and terrorist groups from using its territory to attack the, you know, attack another state. And that in- would include Israel, notwithstanding Lebanon's refusal to either you know, establish diplomatic relations with Israel or to uh, acknowledge Israel's existence. International law also does not allow the use of force uh, to resolve outstanding territorial disputes, right? So that that element uh, is, is Lebanon is precluded from, and they have an active obligation, putting aside 1701. 1701 re, you know, re, restates that obligation, but to prevent their territory from being used to attack another state by a non-state actor. Now, given that that state, uh, right, Israel has been attacked by an actor from within Lebanon, um, Israel has a right to act in self-defense, right? And that's subject to necessity and proportionality. Yazan al-Sadi. I think most people try to 
in this country and most Lebanese, let's say, try to hold on to the Lebanese army as a symbol of unity. But structurally, the Lebanese army was never made really to defend the country from, you know, external forces from its structure. Look at the type of funding it gets, the type of weaponry that it gets, especially from Europe and North America, that isn't really heavy, heavy mun munitions or arms. So it is made, really, I would argue, and other people have argued, to really police internally, whether on refugees or the poorer class, because you saw the Lebanese army deploy itself during the 2019 uprising. But when it comes to something like Israel, it cannot like have the ability to fight, and people understand that. And it's a mixed bag. So there's always this discussion of trying to empower the Lebanese army in order to remove the raison d'etre of an armed resistance movement. So, but if, if, if the LAF gets involved in this fight, then that suddenly implicates Lebanon, right? And suddenly Lebanon's assets, both the LAF itself, any auxiliary assets that may be supporting either Hezbollah's or the LAF's war effort, become fair game for the Israelis. Again, subject to uh, use in bello, distinction, proportionality, military necessity, and unnecessary suffering. And I think Lebanon wants to stay out of this fight. If the Lebanese armed forces act against Israeli aggression, it would be tying itself to Hezbollah, which it doesn't want to do. Another option would be to confront Hezbollah itself. If Lebanon were willing to or able to restrain Hezbollah in any way, then that would negate Israel's right to use force and self-defense right now, because it would be fulfilled through Lebanese action. But the LAF is unwilling to do so, clearly, or unable to do so, or both. And look, if we go back to Lebanon's last civil war, if they get involved one way or another, there's a, there's a, there's a risk that the LAF may fracture along partisan or sectarian lines, and I don't think the Lebanese want that. So the LAF ends up just sitting by the wayside, and regardless of how much training or equipment you pump into them, I think that's going to remain their posture. They will only act by Lebanese consensus, like the rest of Lebanon. Embroil itself with Hezbollah or go against Hezbollah? One option pits it against Israel, and the other option threatens a severe fracturing that has the potential to tear the country apart. Two very bad options. It leaves them with the third option, do nothing. Lebanon has not seen violence and destruction on this scale since the Lebanese Civil War. As of October 31st, 2,865 people have been killed. Over 13,000 have been wounded. Hospitals have been attacked 55 times. Eight are now closed. Between the crippling economic crisis and the political stalemate, the country can ill afford what is happening now. We're seeing efforts for a ceasefire, and an end to the violence would surely be welcomed, even if it's brief. Current reporting suggests a 60-day ceasefire. But somehow, Lebanon and Hezbollah are going to have to come to a more formal arrangement. What is their role in Lebanon? How do they fit into the state structure? And how does their armed wing fit in? And what is Hezbollah's identity going forward? David Dawood again. There, there are certain dogmas that die hard in foreign policy. And one of the dogmas that has been around since 2005 is that, you know, we strengthen the Lebanese state and that acts as a countermeasure against Hezbollah, as if these two, two things are separate and dichotomous. But whereas Lebanon equals Hezbollah equals Lebanon is an oversimplification of matters. But the idea that he Hezbollah and Lebanon are entirely distinct and that the Lebanese state and Hezbollah are entirely distinct is also equally you know, oversimplistic and fictitious. Hezbollah is part of Lebanon's national political and, and social fabric. Whether we like it or not, whether their objectives are desirable or good or not, there are Lebanese citizens that have empowered them to act on their behalf. And you can't tell one segment of Lebanon's population, you know, let's say the, the supporters of Samir Jaja, yes, you get a seat at the table, but then turn to other Lebanese citizens and say, you don't get a say. Uh, that's, you know, Lebanon would fall apart. And final words to Yazan al Saadi. Like, it seems like it's going to be longer, that this is a new norm, even in terms of their demands about 
ha- a- a wanting Israeli freedom to operate in the skies and to have a major uh, buffer zone in the south, that implies continual warfare. You know what I mean? That implies continual violence. So I think a lot of people are slowly grasping that. There's a lot of people also that are still bargaining with themselves about the situation, being like, oh, it couldn't be worse. But really, it could get worse. And it seems to be getting worse. This episode of The New Arab Voice was written and produced by me, Hugo Goodridge. Our theme music was by Omar al Phil. The New Arab Voice is taking a short break, but we'll be back in a few weeks' time with a new episode. Until then, you can find all our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram and X, both at TNA Podcasts, for additional content. And you can email us, podcast at newarab.com. That's podcast at newarab.com. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And you can also rate and review, which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow The New Arab on Facebook, X and Instagram for all the latest news, analysis and opinion from the region.